once again. Yes, here we go. There we go. What a jazzy intro. Yay. Yay. Good morning. Good morning, Timothy. Good morning, everyone who is watching us on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and uh, listening to us uh, in Clubhouse. It's a pleasure to have you with us once again. And of course, it's uh, a pleasure to have Timothy Langley, CEO of uh, Langley Esquire, with us once again on this Sunday morning, September the 17th. And uh, there is a big topic to talk about today. Uh, this is the reshuffle of uh, the cabinet. And of course, there are other things uh, to talk about as well. But I think that, uh, well, we'll probably concentrate mostly on that reshuffle. I don't know. Timothy, what's your take on this? And uh, so uh, what other things are we going to talk about? I, I, I would like you to, to tell us about that. So I don't want to keep you waiting anymore. So I'll give you the floor and uh, you can start talking straight away. Okay. Thank you very much, Maya. And thank you to everybody who is plugging in during this three day weekend. Tomorrow is Respect for Elders Day. It is a national holiday. So I, I expect to get some emails and flowers from, uh, from you guys. Uh, the only time of the year that I might get something like that. Um, but it's a three day weekend. Uh, things are really bubbling all over the planet. Um, there's a lot going on here in Japan that I'd like to brief you on. Uh, the most important thing that has happened over this last week is the reshuffling of the Kishida cabinet, but it's not the only thing. So let me get into uh, some of the things that are going on that envelope not just what's going on with the prime minister who is in New York right now, but also um, what, what it means to Japan, the economy, to wages uh, and inflation, and uh, just the political dynamics that tell us one way or the other that the prime minister is going to survive. Um, his election for the LDP presidency is in exactly one year. It's in September of next year. So uh, the reshuffling of the cabinet was designed to boost up his uh, approval ratings, hopefully. Um, he did get a little bit of a bump, um, but already the knives are being sharpened for the new members of his cabinet as a uh, as the appetite for scandal is never low here in Japan. If you've picked up Bunshun, you probably haven't, but if, um, if you peruse Bunshun in any of the convenience stores, which is the magazine of choice for those people who are looking for a deeper dive into what's going on in Japanese politics and culture and entertainment, um, it is replete with you know close-up views and somewhat um, negative digging into some of the the main players in Japanese politics and industry. So um, with that as an aside, let me get started right away. Um, Kishida, the prime minister was in very busy just this last week. He was in Indonesia and then in India. Um, it was a, 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 I don't know, not a love fest, but um, he was really pushing for uh, an inclusion of the uh, global South which are the, the countries that are not within the G20. Um, they're on the lower rank, but they're also being approached very aggressively uh, by China with the Belt and Road Initiative. And the prime minister is attempting to assert his, his role as a deal maker, as a diplomatic kingpin. I think he's made great uh, strides in that area. He is the, uh, Japan is the chair of the G20 this year. Um, I'm sorry, G7 this year. And he's played a, a really um, great, I think, leadership role when he was um, uh, hosting the G7 leaders in, uh, in Hiroshima. He got a great boost out of that. Uh, it lasted um, very, very shortly, maybe only three weeks before his approval rating began to go down. Uh, he had an opportunity to boost that up with uh, the local elections, which... Um, really uh, just kept the LDP at par. Ishin, the, uh, one of the opposition, main opposition parties, did exceptionally well at that. And his idea of having a snap election uh, soon after that just fizzled out because the LDP didn't do as amazingly well as he had hoped for. Uh, the opportunity to hold a snap election fizzled out very shortly after that. And so the only 
real um, tool in his chest uh, was a reshuffling of the cabinet, which he just carried out this last week. I'd like, I'd like to get into that. But before we do, there are other things that are going on. As we talked about, the, Demo the Democratic Party for the People is probably the third or fourth largest um, opposition party. They had a, an election for their main leader. And uh, it's pretty significant what the choices were that were presented to their members. So um, let me see. Um, the election was between uh, Tamaki Yoichiro and Seiji Maihara. Um, and Mr. Tamaki is or was the current president, and uh, Mr. Maihara was his number two in command, even though he is a little bit older. But both of them have survived election campaigns uh, five, six times. And so they're, uh, they're dominant in the opposition party. And the, the proposition that was proposed to the leaders, Mr. Tamaki said, look, um, in order for us to be effective as an opposition party, we need to form alliances with the LDP. Our issues on the revision of the Constitution, some of these issues that are, are really thorny, we align with the LDP. So we should be more uh, accommodating with the LDP. And maybe, um, maybe after an election or two, we uh, join the LDP as an alliance or as a coalition partner. The opposite of that was um, Mr. Maihada's idea of um, we need to uh, form a better coalition with the opposition party. So there are a lot of opposition parties that are following that path. That, that strategy um, is gaining a lot of attention. Um, Ishin is sometimes on that strategy and sometimes um, kind of leaning towards an, an alliance with the LDP. But I think uh, for Ishin, the idea is they want to be the opposition party of choice in the next election which um, they were able to escape. The pri prime minister didn't call for an election. So the, uh, the uh, opposition parties, including Ishin, has an opportunity to build up their forces in time for an election. If you look at the uh, opportunities for election, many people say um, there's just not enough uh, wind in the sail for the prime minister to call for a, a snap election before his term of office ends next year. At the same time, there are other pundits who are mentioning that there's uh, movement underfoot for a snap election um, before the end of the year. I, I don't think that that's uh, logistically possible, um, but, you know, it's Japanese politics, so anything can happen. In any event, the Democratic uh, Party for the People has, um, let me see, they have, uh, I think, um, how many members do they have? Uh, I think they have, uh, like, I want to get this right. Um, maybe uh, 25 members in the uh, lower house. Um, and the idea was to um, give to the members of their political party the choice. Should we align closely with the LDP or should we go with the opposition party, form a coalition with them and fight uh, against the LDP, try and topple them? in the next election or the election after that, because these things move so slowly. So it looks like the Democratic People's Party is aligning with the LDP with the uh, ascension of Mr. Tamaki. He's replacing himself uh, as the leader of that. It's somewhat important uh, to, to continue to follow that. Um, and I wanted to bring that to your attention. That just happened this last week. The other thing that's going on is the Ed Unification Church. So the um, education ministry is uh, hammering the Unification Church. You might remember that this is the church that was blamed for um, kind of the assassination of former Prime Minister Abe and the uh, interactions between the Unification Church and Japanese politics, largely uh, the Abe faction, but not exclusively. So um, there has been some movement there. The uh, Education Ministry is pressing uh, the Unification Church for documents on seven occasions over the last uh, eight months. They have requested specifically documents under something like a court uh, court review, but it's not in the court yet, but it is with the ministry that has um, uh, the power of uh, acknowledging a, an organization as having church-like attributes and therefore getting tax uh, treatment. 
So the Unification Church has that, and the uh, granting authority is the education ministry, and they are asking for more and more documents, and they've uh, just submitted a, um, a complaint that um, the responses that have been provided uh, over the last uh, eight months on seven different occasions are not um, truly compelling, and they're not adequate enough. But you can see that uh, pretty much the line has already been drawn. It's just a setup for you know, getting more information, more incriminating information for them so that they disband the Unification Church. I think that is the direction that is going. Initially, it will be um, seeking a fine for them not proactively participating in this process with the education ministry. And so I think this is going to go forward um, very slowly. And the reason why I say slowly is because there are many, um, even ministers, the new ministers, um, who have ties to what was going on with the Unification Church. If you're in the LDP, you might remember that uh, the LDP insisted that if you had any ties with the LDP when this scandal first broke, that you um, you cease them now, you write a, uh, a letter to the LDP promising that you have dis disengaged with um, the Unification Church, you list all of the activities that you've had, and that we wipe the slate, slate clean. That issue is going to come up later when I talk about the new cabinet, but it is, um, uh, interesting that uh, the education minister has changed now. Cur uh, previously, it was um, um, an individual from the ASO faction, Keiko Nakaoka, and now it is, uh, um, sorry, it, the current uh, minister is one of the females who have been joined in the cabinet, one of the five females, and her name is Nago Nagaoka Keiko. She's with the ASO faction. And um, she is replacing uh, Mr. Moriyama Masahito, who was with the Kishida faction. That's somewhat important, their um, uh, faction affiliation, because in the groupings that they have, they typically meet once a week, uh, the faction. So if you have a minister of state who is uh, meeting with the faction heads and the faction leader, um, information is shared and you can design certain strategies that other faction leaders don't have the opportunity for. So it's really important when you get a, a ministerial portfolio for your faction to be engaged in that. And the fact that it has gone from the Kishida faction into the Aso faction is of some significance. So we're going to continue to follow that. Um, but what I wanted to say is that there are four current members of the um, cabinet that would, was just announced with deep unification church ties. And they have told everybody, they've told um, uh, Mr. Motegi, who was instructed, who has instructed them, you know, I want you to put down on a piece of paper, you know, what your affiliations were and that you've disengaged with them. And these four key members are um, uh, Mr. Moriyama, who I just mentioned um, earlier, um, Mr. Kihara, who is the defense minister, uh, Mr. Suzuki Junji, who is now internal affairs. He is with the Abe faction. And Ito Shintaro, who is the environment minister, who is from the Aso faction. So um, 11 new members of a 19-member uh, cabinet, that's brand new members. And I think this unification church is not going to be uh, dead very soon. I think uh, when people are looking at um, places to throw rocks is uh, a way to attack the prime minister, the Unification Church issue will be one of those. And I suspect that in the near term, um, this Unification Church issue and the affiliations that these members of parliament had in developing the Unification Church to be a political force in Japanese politics, somewhat akin to what happened with uh, Komeito and uh, the religious affiliation that they had, um, I think that it's going to uh, be an issue for some of the members. And when the prime minister was vetting these um, potential cabinet members, uh, the screening and the due diligence was, I think, rather lighthearted. Um, he wanted to change. There were two schools of thought, by the way, and he chose the second one very quickly. But one school of thought was um, that he would uh, retain most of the cabinet. There wouldn't be a big change. And the second school of thought was, we need to revamp it. We need to put new faces in there. There are lots of members who have survived five uh, cabinet, five um, uh, 
election terms and they deserve a cabinet portfolio and we've got a long list we've got maybe 30 people who are waiting for that um so we need to reinvigorate the cabinet and we need to begin to doyle out these uh, cabinet portfolios because otherwise people become very upset with their faction leaders for not getting um the right kind of um uh, acknowledgement after they've survived, uh, you know, so long and br brought so many um, members into the LDP. So um, uh, the screening process basically is voluntary. The members submit that to the LDP. The LDP accepts it at face value. But there are still people who um, uh, are very critical and scrutinizing this. So you might remember in the first Kishida cabinet, uh, there was uh, an individual by the name of Yamagiwa Daishiro. He was the economic revitalization minister. Um, and he um, kind of wasn't very clear about his affiliation with the Unification Church. He made a couple of misstatements, and that really knocked the wind out of uh, the prime minister and out of Mr. Uh, Yamagiwa. And he resigned. And um, in fact, he was one of the four people that resigned, four cabinet members that resigned in the early uh, Kishida administration. And we've said here before, there has been no prime minister who has had four ministers of state resign in their terms of office and still survived. So uh, Mr. Kishida has survived. He's uh, well into his, um, his second year. Um, and so, uh, you know, the scrutiny that came initially, Mr. Yamagiwa made a misstatement he initially he immediately resigned from the cabinet. But there's also um, uh, Mr. Hagiura Koichi, who is with the Abe faction, a very prominent member of the Abe faction. And he was likewise also very much engaged in the, uh, the Unification Church. He is um, one of the key members, one of the leaders of the Abe faction. He is not the leader. There's a 15 member committee uh, headed by a chairman of the committee, but no specific leader has been identified. And um, he was very much engaged in the Unification Church, and that was kind of smoothed over. Not only was it smoothed over, um, but he retains his position within the LDP structure. So what your tie is with the Unification Church, it's a damaging thing, but how the, uh, the party deals with it is, seems to be very um, uh, depending on who you are and how much power your faction has. Moving on, um, the minimum wage um, is giving uh, Mr. Kishida a real headache while he was in India. When he was in India, he did two things. He had a policy speech about the minimum wage, but he also announced about his cabinet reshuffle. Uh, we had anticipated the cabinet reshuffle to end, um, to happen probably towards the end of the month, but it ended in the, it happened in the middle of the month. So, um, that was one of the announcements. The other announcement that he made is that, um, he wanted to raise the minimum wage. He was successful in raising it this year to uh, 1,000 yen per hour for uh, part-time and regular workers. And um, uh, that's about, uh, in US dollars, about $6.80. So it, over a long time struggle, Mr. Abe also promised that he was gonna be raising the wages to 1,000 yen per hour. Uh, finally, they, uh, Mr. Kishida was successful in achieving that, um, but it kind of happened at the same time that the inflation rate was going up. So. Um, the prime minister is being hammered by even uh, increasing the wages, not getting a slap on the back because inflation going at three, four, five percentage points um, continues to eat at that. And so people are spending less and they're very unhappy with uh, the economy. They're not having children. They're not buying houses or uh, white products. And so it is um, having a draw on the, on the economy. As we mentioned in our last briefing, most of the economic um, activity that supporting Japan is coming from foreign sources, foreign demand. So that's an export market for uh, Japanese goods and services. And Japan is importing uh, sometimes raw material or sometimes parts and components and putting those into uh, fixed goods. But the vast majority of the um, revenue Japan generates as a part of their GDP is guided by uh, external forces. So getting that uh, internal economic engine going really depends a lot on um, the, um, uh, the wages and, and economic uh, activity here. So what the prime minister said in India was, on economic measures, I want to make 
um, them to protect the people's lives from price hikes and reinforce the trend of wage increases and investment expansion. I want to carry out drastic steps supported firmly by a necessary budget. So he kept his, his finance ministry um, uh, minister, uh, but he did change some of the other ministers that have an impact on that. And we will be watching what they're doing uh, very closely. So um, the supply, the labor supply seems to be decreasing. There is, there is a, um, a structure in the Japanese economy. Uh, you might've heard of it. It's called the 1.3 million yen barrier. So below 1.3 million as income, you're not, you're not contributing as much into the social insurance uh, system. But once you have 1.3 million in wages or above, you're supposed to contribute to that. So even though you might be earning 1.4 or 1.5, all of a sudden, since you're contributing a portion of your wages to the in, uh, social insurance premium, your real wages actually fall. So there's a, a dead man's zone after that. So as a consequence, people artificially keep their salary level lower. They don't work as many hours. They don't have their wife working um, uh, in, in a secondhand job, that sort of thing. And um, so the annual hours of workers in Japan right now is 958 uh, just this last year. And in um, uh, 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 2023, it was um, 10,000, I'm sorry, 1,093 hours. So um, the number of hours that are being worked, it tells you that the vibrancy and the productivity of the, the Japanese normal weight wage earner is decreasing. They're working less hours. They're getting um, a little bit more money, but inflation is eating that. So as a consequence, I think you can see that the, the psychological impact on, on laborers is, um, is uh, pretty, pretty devastating for the prime minister. So he has committed that he's going to work on that. The other issue that's bothering the prime minister is this bribery scandal with um, Masatoshi Akimoto, who is 48 years old in the lower house. He was vice minister of foreign affairs and vice minister for um, uh, land and transportation previously. Um, he was implicated in a bribery scandal. He is a real proponent of wind power and renewable energy. He's uh, in the LDP. Uh, he was caught with a, a, a bribery of a company that is building um, offshore and onshore uh, wind turbines to generate uh, electricity in Aomori Prefecture. Um, and it turns out that um, he received kind of um, a, a total in, in different uh, combinations of 60 million uh, yen, and about 30 million of that was uh, for a loan without interest payments. So that became um, a, an issue. How he did it and how this kind of came into the... Um, into the public um, view was that he made a, a statement under uh, the diet uh, hearings talking about, you know, renewable energy and Aomori and how they need to expand on that. And apparently he did that because he was being encouraged by uh, the president of this company. And he also, um, his hobby listed uh, is horses and horse racing. And apparently he and this president went together and bought a racehorse. And that's kind of how things started there. But it does have a good uh, um, inflection on Japanese politicians uh, to be uh, investing in horse racing. But it, it is the thing that happened to him. So he resigned from the LDP. Um, it looks like he will probably be um, uh, resigning from, uh, from politics as well. But this is a big shakeup. It's a big shakeup, specifically not uh, towards the, the prime minister, but to um, uh, Mr. Suga, who he was affiliated with. So there's a lot of um, uh, scrutiny that's being directed because of Mr. Akimoto at Mr. Suga and what he's doing with renewable energy. So as a consequence of that, you might have noticed if you're in the industry that there has been a toning down of how much attention uh, renewable energy is getting. And with what's going on in Fukushima and the release of the water and the all of the attention throughout Southeast Asia and the world, in fact, about Japan's uh, nuclear energy capacity in their industry and their push to renewables, it's really a, um, a real uh, punch in the face for uh, the prime minister who has said, you know, by 2030, 2040, 
we want to have a, the vast majority of energy uh, being produced by renewables, and that looks like it's going to be a far away target. Um, moving on, Kim Jong Un, our great leader, as you might um, know him as, uh, from North Korea, was very active, but thankfully it wasn't in launching missiles this last week. He actually met with um, Vladimir Putin in Vladivostok. And not only did, did he do that, but he left North Korea. It's the first time that he's left the country in four years. He's been um, not traveling at all, but he took his uh, train, his luxury train, and went to Vladivostok. He's going to be in, in Russia touring. He toured um, the, uh, space, um, the, the, the space launch uh, facility in, um, in Russia as well. He met Putin um, in Vladivostok and also at the spaceport. And apparently they are talking, Russia and uh, North Korea are talking about um, munitions and also satellite technology and launch capabilities. So as Joe Biden and this group of like-minded countries are beginning to form this coalition, Quad, <clears throat> um, um, the, um, the Japan, South Korea, U.S. Uh, trilateral uh, engagement, all of the, the countries that are coming together for some military performance or alliance uh, in the South Pacific is not standing alone. I mean, the, the Russians are building that too. The Russians occupy the four northern territories um, uh, above Hokkaido. They've been carrying on exercises, naval exercises, and live fire drills with China as well. And so this, this coalition of like-minded uh, countries isn't occurring just on behalf of the United States or just on behalf of you know, those countries that don't want China to invade Taiwan, but there's a lot going on on the other side of that equation as well. So the fact that Kim Jong-un um, went to, uh, to Russia and for an extended period actually uh, is of somewhat um, big significance. So he will be back in uh, the, the hot seat uh, this next week. And so I think we can expect to see um, more developments along those lines with this alliance um, growing between uh, Russia and North Korea. Um, let me see. We've got the, um, the cabinet reshuffle. Um, they, the prime minister announced the cabinet on Wednesday. It's been in the news a lot and I'd like to talk a little bit about it. Um, the cabinet um, reshuffle triggered the prime minister's approval rating to shoot up. Just briefly, they did a, a wide poll on Thursday and Friday, they announced the results yesterday, and his um, approval rating is now at 39.8%. Uh, that might be somewhat inflated because it's a big in the news and people are feeling good about it, but 39.8% is uh, reputably uh, reported. On the other hand, there is 43% uh, who are ambivalent or negative about it. So the, um, the jury is still out about how well he's going to be doing as a consequence of a new uh, leadership in, in the cabinet. So the way Japanese politics works, there's a cabinet and then there are four um, or five key posts within the LDP. So these are two different things that typically happen at the same time. When the prime minister changes the cabinet, he typically replaces or changes some of the members in the LDP. There are four key posts in the LDP sometimes five, but four key ones. And then in the, in the cabinet, there are 19 formal members of the cabinet. And in this current uh, shuffling of the cabinet, of the 19 members, 11 of them are new, and some of them are brand new into the cabinet. It's the first cabinet uh, portfolio that they've had. So it's um, significant in a bunch of different ways, and I'd like to talk about what those ways are. And by the way, while I'm on it, um, many of you know Dan Harada, who is a regular fixture within uh, uh, LDP politics. He is a, a nationalized Frenchman who has been dealing in Japanese politics. I've known Dan for 40 years. Um, even when I was a diet secretary, I knew Dan. He was, um, you know, being engaged, and, and he changed his citizenship so he could engage. He's a member of the LDP. He gives a breakfast briefing every month about LDP politics and what's going on with the prime minister. So he, Dan and I got together this last week and we filmed an analysis of the, uh, the new cabinet. I think that will be uploaded. It's a, a YouTube video that will be uploaded um, t 
tomorrow or the next day. I'm not sure when, but we're, it's going through an editing process now. But let's talk about who the prime minister kept um, in his lineup. So he, as I said earlier, he was struggling with continuity or new change. And he kind of went with the new change, but the continuity parts of it are uh, significant too. So within the LDP part of it, the four or five seats that are important there, and they're not cabinet portfolios, but they are important um, in guiding the prime minister in running his government. So um, just as an aside, in Japanese politics, the prime minister is not like the president uh, in many countries. Um, he doesn't weld uh, all of the power and it all comes to the top of the pyramid. He is um, approved and elected by members of the parliament. And the LDP, since it has the majority of those votes, always selects who the prime minister is going to be. Um, and um, the, the prime minister shares the power with his cabinet. And that's why the cabinet and the cabinet reshuffle is so important because in Japanese politics, it's not just the prime minister, the ministers of state also hold uh, incredible power. And that's why when there's any kind of inference or inflection about them doing a dirty deal or uh, one of their diet secretaries accepting too many cookies, um, it becomes a big issue and um, it, it really um, begins to snowball um, on, on criticism that is lodged towards the ministers. So the prime minister is really um, uh, guided to pick his ministers very carefully. And as I said earlier, it doesn't look like the due diligence on the Unification Church was that um, uh, squeaky clean. So it could come up and, and bite the prime minister. In fact, um, there are two issues that came up as the uh, press reported the, the uh, shuffling of the cabinet. Uh, Ms. Obuchi and Mr. Uh, Takemi. Um, so Ms. Obuchi is with the election strategy within the LDP port part of it. And Mr. Takemi is um, the new labor minister and um, I'm sorry, health minister. And he was criticized um, for having um, ties with the medical industry. He is a hereditary um, member. I think he's maybe, uh, he's close to 70 years old. Um, and his, his father was very prominent as well. Um, but I've known Mr. Takemi, um, even when I was a diet secretary, he was a, a member of the parliament in the upper house. His office actually was two or three doors away from where, um, where I was. So I've known him for a long time but he's getting some heat too. So, and this is the first week. So uh, as people dig, as enemies of the prime minister begin to surface, uh, you'll see more and more of that. But of the people who stayed, of course, the prime minister kept Mr. Tato Aso as his vice president. So previously under the Abe administration, Mr. Tato Aso was finance minister. And he's, he, of course, the longest serving finance minister as Mr. Kishida was the longest serving uh, foreign minister. So he retains his party post. <clears throat> Chief Cabinet Secretary Matsuno, who is with the Abe faction, retained his pro post. The uh, chief, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister, Mr. Suzuki, who is with the Aso faction, he retained his post. And um, um, let me see, where should I go? Maybe the uh, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, Mr. Nishimura, retained his post. He's also with the Abe faction. Um, you've got. Uh, Kono Taro retained his post. That's somewhat of a surprise because he received so much criticism and he is a, a kind of a lightning rod to attract criticism because although he is a, he was a candidate for uh, prime minister, he, he's not the faction head. And in fact, his faction head is Mr. Aso, who did not stand behind him and support him as prime minister as a candidate. And as a consequence of that, I'm sure if he had received that endorsement, he would be prime minister today, but Tato Aso did not do that for whatever reasons. We can get into that another time. But surprisingly, Tato Aso, I think it's a great, um, great decision, retains his uh, portfolio as minister of uh, the digital industry. <clears throat> Let me see, we've got um, uh, minister of uh, infrastructure, uh, Tetsuo Saito is remaining in his position. Um, Economic Security Minister uh, Takaichi uh, remains in her position. Um, and then the rest of them are, um, are new. 
Um, but before I get into the ministers who are new, let's go to the LDP part of it, which is the Secretary General remains there, Mr. Motegi. Um, Mr. Hagiura, who has the, um, the policy research chief, he remains, he's in the Abe faction. Um, there's been a, just a little bit of a change there with um, General Council Chair Moriyama. He has gone to a different post and relieved his previous post, which was Election Strategy Headquarters Chief, to uh, uh, Yuko Obuchi. And this is um, a, a great thing for her. It is a, a new thing for uh, this post. I mean, uh, I don't think um, there has been a female um, election strategy headquarters chief in the past. And so her ascension into that role is um, noteworthy and not just for that reason, but I'll get into that later. <clears throat> Excuse me. Talking about the new faces, you've got health and labor um, minister Takemi, who I mentioned earlier. He is with the ASO faction. You've got Internal Affairs and Communications Minister Suzuki. He's with the Abe faction. You've got um, Foreign Affairs Minister Kamikawa. She is with the Kishida faction. Um, she is replacing Mr. Uh, Haya, um, uh, Hayashi, um, who is number two in the uh, Kishida faction. And people were wondering what he was going to do. He was a great foreign minister at a tumultuous time in Japanese politics. And he is, uh, he doesn't have a post now. He doesn't have a ministerial portfolio or an LDP party post, but he does have his eyes set on the prime minister's position. And I think having him out of the cabinet allows him to be um, a little bit more vocal about what's going on with the Kishida administration. And I think we're going to hear much more from him. Uh, the defense minister is also new. This is Mr. Kihara, who's uh, well-versed. Um, I think he's going to do a an excellent job. He replaces Mr. Hamada, who was from the Chiba uh, prefecture. Mr. Hamada was an independent who was elected as a defense minister. Mr. Kihara, on the other hand, is in the Motegi faction. Um, the Minister of Justice is uh, Mr. Koizumi. The Minister of Reconstruction is uh, Ms. Suchida. She is an independent. And um, uh, the Justice Minister is uh, Koizumi from the Nikai faction. Uh, you've also got, mm, let me see, um, M Minister of Education, Moriyama, who is new to the post. He's in, in the Kishida faction. Minister of Agriculture is a big one. That's with Mr. Miyashita. He is in the Abe faction. And one of the um, interesting features of the current uh, cabinet is that the Minister for Infrastructure remains uh, Mr. Saito, who is the Komeito um, uh, member. So Komeito, in its alliance with the LDP, receives, depending on how helpful they are, one, two, maybe three cabinet portfolios. And for Mr. Saito, he retains his seat. So this is the longest time for uh, Komeito to hold one single post. We talked about this last week, about how important it is, if you're the prime minister, to change these ministers, especially with Komeito, because they begin to build a base. And here with uh, the Ministry of Infrastructure, building that base, it's a national um, uh, opportunity for Komeito to establish, establish itself and to reward members of, uh, of their party with certain perks as, a, an, as an affiliation. So that's a, an important thing. I had expected that that would change, that Komeito would get a different portfolio but the prime minister has retained him once again, suggesting he's really trying hard to keep stability and consistency, even in light of the fact that he's changed out 11 of his members. We've also got the public safety commission chairman who is Matsumura. He is with the Motegi faction um, and minister in charge of declining birth rate is Miss Kato. She's an independent. The minister of the environment, Mr. Ito is with the Aso faction. And the Minister for Economic Revitalization is Miss Jimmy, who is in the Nikai faction. Um, so there's a lot of changes that are going on there. I think of, of keen interest is the fact that um, not only are 19, uh, 11 of the new cabinet members um, brand new to the, the post, but um, there are, if, if you include the cabinet, the 19 in the cabinet and the four that are in the LDP, there are six women that have joined this administration. That is a record. Um, Mr. Koizumi 
um, and Mr. Abe had um, five in the cabinet, but it's it's quite rare. Mr. Abe's uh, cabinet was in 2014, I believe, and he had four, uh, five women in his cabinet. Koizumi did the same thing years earlier, um, but this is significant. I think it's significant. It's the prime minister trying to appeal to the women base and set himself up so that he's got more popularity that he could potentially call for an election. I mean, it just depends on so many things, what he does with wages, what he's doing with Fukushima, what he's doing with the uh, the diplomacy with North Korea, South Korea, um, Taiwan, what's going on there, the building of uh, the um, uh, chip wafers in uh, Hokkaido and in Kumamoto. Uh, there's just a lot going on where he could gain a little bit more popularity. And you know he's looking for those. There's also uh, five hereditary, actually six hereditary um, members in the uh, cabinet right now. Uh, agriculture and forester minister, the environment, reconstruction, low fertility, and local development. In addition to, on the LDP side, um, uh, Miss Obuchi, who is also a hereditary um, member. And that's an important aspect of how Japanese politicians become politicians in the first place. It's not unique to Japan. It happens in other countries around the world where the dad passes on his network and his um, skill set to his son or his daughter. But it is a prominent feature. It's a prominent feature as the LDP um, and the faction system are, um, you know, kind of signature uh, attributes of Japanese politics. Also, the, um, the high uh, degree of hereditary politicians as well. Um, the other kind of interesting thing is that um, Mr. Hayashi was replaced by, um, uh, um, let me see, by, um, why do I get her name wrong all the time? Uh, Yamikawa. Um, they both went to Harvard. I think she is very competent. She was Minister of Justice three times. So she is well-practiced. Uh, she's well-spoken. I think she will do a good job. I think the prime minister replaced in the foreign ministry a kind of dove with a dove. Um, Mr. Hayashi um, was uh, criticized for being soft on China, um, but I think he, he played a key role in, in the G7 and just in diplomacy in general. He is he's a very seasoned uh, fellow. He is a hereditary member of the parliament as well. And I think the foreign ministry is in is in good hands with uh, Ms. Yamikawa there. The defense ministry on the other side was a hawk being replaced with a hawk. So I think although uh, Mr. Hamada was uh, an independent member of the LDP, he still had hawkish views. And I think he did well as defense minister uh, during a pretty critical time. And I think his, um, his replacement, Mr. Uh, Tamaki will also uh, pursue that. He's actually, uh, I, I think Mr. Uh, Tamaki is uh, I'm sorry, uh, Kihara is um, more well-versed in um, defense policies and has more experience in it than even Mr. Hamada did. So um, I don't think we're going to see a lot of changes in that area. The interesting thing to, to point out here is that uh, Mr. Hayashi comes from the election district contiguous to Mr. Abe's uh, election district. And uh, during the restructuring and gerrymandering, Mr. Abe's election district was merged together with Mr. Hayashi's election district. And the LDP keenly wants to maintain that, um, that diet seat, even though five seats throughout the country were uh, gerrymandered to be spread to those highly populated areas. Of those 10, five of them went to Tokyo, as you know. But in, um, in the district um, where Mr. Hayashi is, it's still unsettled. So in the next election, the two will be merged, and um, Mr. Hayashi definitely wants to have that seat. So I think probably uh, relinquishing his post to focus on that is, um, is his main objective. But I also think that um, he wasn't a, a candidate for prime minister. Um, and I think the next time the prime minister's race comes up, which is a year from now, um, you're not only going to see Konotaro and probably uh, Sanai Takaichi, um, but also maybe uh, Mr. Hayashi as well. So it will be a, a real um, mixed field. 
One of the other contenders, potential contenders, is, is Mr. Motegi, who retains his seat as probably the number two or three most powerful position within Japanese politics. You've got the prime minister, you've got the chief cabinet secretary, or maybe the finance minister, but you've also got the um, the secretary general of the LDP. And it's, it's kind of a toss up depending on dynamics, um, personalities, which one is the most powerful. But I think probably Mr. Motegi um, is in the one of the top three positions. If his relationship with the prime minister was better, it would probably elevate his status. But uh, the relationship between those two gentlemen is not very good. And that's why uh, the prime minister kept him in that position, because under LDP tradition, you're not supposed to, if you're in the cabinet, you're not supposed to be criticizing the prime minister. You're supposed to be following the line and participating as well as you can. Uh, Mr. Motegi is known to be a difficult person to deal with, and he hasn't had a good relationship with the prime minister. And that's why this triangle between Mr. Uh, uh, Kishida and Mr. Motegi is balanced out by Mr. Taro Aso. So this, this triangle relationship, um, it actually is missing a fourth leg, which is somebody from the Abe faction. But the way it stands right now, uh, Mr. Abe, uh, Mr. Um, Aso is... Uh, playing a really key role in keeping the tensions down, but they could flare up uh, pretty quickly and easily uh, given the the political dynamics and what's going on. The other thing that Mr. Um, Kishida did was, in addition to the cabinet reshuffle and the shuffle of the LDP, there are also uh, 60 or 80 um, sub-cabinet uh, portfolios that also change. So it's not just at the top, it also goes all the way down. And um, these assignments were released uh, Thursday or Friday. I got a list of them. And so they do change the chairs and some of the people who were in one position end up in another position or they end up out of a position uh, for the time being. One of those people was um, Mr. Kihara, who was a, a key advisor to the prime minister. His name has come up a couple of times here because he was embroiled in this uh, scandal or potential scandal of the woman he eventually married. Her husband was killed. Um, the public prosecutors in an investigation uh, claimed that it was a suicide. This happened 10, 11 years ago. And over time, it has come out that um, when you review the evidence of the death, it was more of a murder than a suicide. And Mr. Kihara was in a relationship with his estranged wife at the time and is now his her, her husband. Um, and the suggestion was that he used his power and influence um, to dominate the uh, public prosecutor's office so that they kept this issue aside. And they said it was a suicide. He killed himself by slitting his own throat. And the family has been hammering the public prosecutor's office. They finally got a little bit of traction over the last uh, couple of months, maybe four months. And Bunshin was constantly hitting Mr. Kihara for maybe six or seven issues in a row. Um, so it looked like uh, Mr. I mean, very few can survive that sort of onslaught by uh, the powerful um, rag magazine, uh, Boonshun. Uh, but not only did he, but he received uh, another post, not within the prime minister's office, but in Mr. Motegi's office. So if you're Mr. Motegi and you see that uh, the prime minister has inserted his chief lieutenant into your organization as um, secretary general of the LDP, which is his, his right to be able to do that, uh, you can imagine that the temperatures uh, continue to rise up, which means that um, Mr. Motegi is not really in a position to do a whole lot that benefits him and diminishes the prime minister because the prime minister has one of his chief lieutenants right there in the office following um, the secretary general in all of the things that he's doing. So um, the final thing that I want to talk about is the role of women in Japanese politics. And as you know, um, Japan has been lambasted for um, being a laggard in including women in politics and in uh, society in general, in uh, business and economy. Let me see if the um, uh, Japan ranked 125th in the World Economic Forum's gender equality ranking of 146 countries. Japan ranked 125th out of 146. And it um, ma made an especially low ranking of 138 in the political sector. 
So of the 146 countries that were analyzed, Japan came in 138 in the political sector. And a lot of that is, is um, due to women, women's ability to come into politics. So the fact that the cabinet now has five females and there is one new female in the LDP structure, that's six females now, uh, that's pretty significant. And so I just want to get into a little bit about how they got into their office because it's somewhat of a suggestion or a microcosm about how people generally get into politics. But also for women, they, you know, you actually need a little bit more of a boost. It's not a level playing field. So if you have a hereditary um, lineage that your father was a member of the parliament and you come in, it does make things a little bit easier but you also criticize probably um, more uh, vigorously than even uh, the, um, the, the male members who might have done the same sort of thing and been criticized for it, but their, um, their terms of attrition and being out of the limelight is much shorter than it is with females. So getting right to that, um, the first on the list is Miss Obuchi. Um, she is the daughter of former Prime Minister Keizo Obuchi, and there's a lot of history going on here. Uh, her father died in office, and Mr. Mori, who was the chairman of the Olympic Committee, was at his deathbed and reported that um, Mr. Obuchi, um, in his dying words, said, I want you to take over the leadership of the LDP. And then suddenly, um, kind of out of the blue, Mr. Mori became the leader of uh, he became prime minister, in fact, and people were scratching their heads wondering how that happened. And it kind of happened just like that. And uh, so there's a, a real tension that continues even today uh, with with Mr. Modi and several members of the uh, of the uh, parliament in general. But he is very influential in the Abe faction. So Mr. Modi took over the Abe faction as their head and then he became prime minister. But uh, Yuko Obuchi, she's 49 years old. She's the youngest member. Uh, of the cabinet, and um, she took over her father's position. She was uh, his diet secretary initially, and she won her uh, first lower house election in uh, the year 2000. Um, and um, I think her her role, she when she became um, a member of the cabinet under the first Abe administration in 2014, she was almost immediately uh, criticized for a fund scandal. Two of her diet aides uh, took the hit for that. They were arrested and um, uh, uh, charged for doing something funny with the money. She apologized for that and resigned from her position as economic minister. And for the last 12 years, she has been in the wilderness biding her time because every time her name comes up, um, they reference back to this time when her aides were arrested. And it might have been that actually it was all at her hand and then the, the secretaries were hired to take the blame for it. it that happens pretty frequently too. We, we really don't know the full story there, but Boon Shun loves to hit on her. And this week's issue of Boon Shun didn't waste any time. They hit on her uh, really violently. Um, and so the fact that she's in the LDP, she's one of the four positions in a very key position, election strategy. Um, I think she's going to do well, but I think there's going to be a lot of heat that's generated at her somewhat unfairly. Uh, she's been clean, uh, but they love to bring up what's going on, what, what happened in the past. And plus, with her father being prime minister, there are skeletons in that closet and there are enemies that he has as well. Um, uh, Ayuko Kato is a Columbia University graduate, and she comes from Yamagata. This is, um, let me see, uh, she is with the Tanigaki um, faction. And um, her father was really prominent um, as a kind of a rebel against uh, uh, the LDP. And he tried to, to kind of do something of a, a, revel of a rebellion. Um, he's quite famous. You might see him on TV when they're talking about her with her father at the podium and kind of tears coming out and him surrounded by his uh, compatriots saying, you know, Gambate and you know, you're the boss, but he eventually did uh, resign as a consequence of that somewhat of a fiasco going against the grain. Uh, but she is now, um, uh, let me see, she's, um, uh, what is, what is? Well, that's, 
the declining birth rate minister? That's right, declining birth rate minister, which is good because you know it, it's an, an issue that has consistently gone to a woman. And yes. it, you might remember during the G7, um, there was uh, uh, a bunch of, of the politicians from all over the world uh, gathered. They were all represented by women in, in this kind of a area. And the representative from Japan was a, a, a male. So it did cause a little bit of consternation. Um, I want to go on to um, Riedel Vitalization, Rural Vitalization Minister. Hanako Jimmy is 47 years old. She's a pediatrician that turned lawmaker. And uh, her father uh, served as postal minister in uh, 1997 and in 2010. Um, so he's a veteran politician. She came in um, and uh, now she has a, a, a ministerial portfolio and that's going to boost her. And um, unfortunately her father was eventually kicked out of the LDP when he created a new party called the People's New Party and served as its leader before it was um, disbanded. So there's a little bit of history there, but the fact is that now she is in uh, the, the parliament. She is, um, let me see, she was parliamentary vice minister for health when the Diamond Princess sailed into Yokohama. And you mem might remember that that's when COVID first began, uh, became a, a huge issue here. And so she's, she's been through the rough and tumble She's also married to um, former Prime Minister Ryutaro Hashimoto. She's married to his eldest son. So that also helps when you're running for politics. Uh, Tsuchiya Shinako is 71 years old. She's a new reconstruction minister. And she also took over from her father. He was in the upper house. Um, he was uh, actually president of the upper house, which is a big deal. And he was the former governor of Saitama. Um, uh, she's been elected eight times, which is a big deal. Um, but this is her first cabinet post, so we can anticipate, um, you know, some some real movement going on here as she tries to establish herself. But as uh, she's 71 years old, it's it's likely that this will be her last portfolio. <clears throat> but you never know. Um, there are two other females, uh, female ministers, Sanai Takaichi, who's 72 years old. She retained her position as economic security minister, and Yuko, uh, Yoko Kamikawa, who is 70 years old, as foreign minister. Neither of them were born uh, to political families. They did this all on their own. Uh, Yoko Kamikawa, Kami, Kawa, Kami, darn. Kamikawa um, was also at Harvard, as was uh, Mr. Hayashi. She's well-spoken. She was justice minister for three years. She was justice minister when the order came for the execution of Om Shinrikyo, the leader there, and I think maybe 12 or 13 of his members, they were all executed, and that requires her personal signature when she was justice minister. So people remember her um, in, in that light. Um, and uh, let me see. Yeah, I think for justice and for defense, you're not going to see a whole lot of change. I think you're going to see a lot of competence there. The fact that the two um, significant uh, former members under the Kish first Kishida uh, cabinet that they are out doesn't signal a huge change there. So I think in diplomacy and defense, you're going to see pretty much of the same thing. Once again, Dan Harada and I get into it uh, in greater detail in uh, in a video that will be produced today, tomorrow, maybe uh, Tuesday. But please stay tuned for that. Thank you for your comments and con um, uh, suggestions. Please don't forget to hit like, pass this on to your friends, and um, Let's continue this dialogue on what's going on in Japanese politics. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Timothy. Well, uh, that was really a very detailed and uh, informative. Do you call that rundown of uh, the cabinet and the new members? Uh, it was really, um, well, well, well. Yeah, sorry, I, I keep stumbling on some of the names because even to me, um, they're somewhat new. So I'm getting comfortable with it as well. Yes, they are. So thank you very much indeed for uh, letting us know uh, about all these details and uh, it's I, I believe that it's also uh, good to know how things happen in Japanese politics so that uh, you have an idea of uh, you know what might happen in uh, the next uh, half well half an year two years or so um, well and then uh, we're moving into the Q&A session um, first of all uh, let me go to yes here we go uh, clubhouse and I know that uh, 
Lynn, you are there. Uh, Hi, Lynn. You have questions. So uh, you can uh, come up on stage and uh, you know talk about uh, the questions you have. Ask them. Here we go. Uh, in the meantime, Timothy. So uh, I have a couple of questions about. Yes. This. Oh, Lynn. Okay. Yes. Hello, Maya. Yeah. Oh, hello, Lynn. It's yeah. so very nice to yes. have you with us again. Thank you for joining. Yeah, me too. Uh, so good morning, uh, Timothy from Vietnam. Um, I have a questions about uh, Japan um, as a middle power. As uh, I'm learning about Japan role as a middle power in uh, bridging partnerships between Southeast Asian countries and uh, Quad member states, including uh, Japan, Australia, India, and the United States. Um, so it's more about a theoretical question. But here in our club room, I will try to make it less academic as possible and uh, make it very simple. Um, so basically, when I read uh, academic works by uh, Japanese scholars, um, I found that some argue that Japan as a middle power, uh, which they uh, emphasize on uh, Japan efforts in uh, continuing in, in uh, continuous deepening security cooperation with uh, its biggest security ally, the, Euro the United States, uh, while also exercising leadership through constructive diplomacy in the region uh, to mitigate the competition between the US and China, which are categorized as uh, great powers. Um, however, interestingly, uh, what I heard from my South Korean friends is they said that Japan is too powerful to be considered a middle power. And uh, they think that Japan is behaving modestly and by acting as a middle power, Japan wants to avoid its uh, historical aggressiveness in Asia. So um, it seems to me that only in the academic communities uh, that this concept is widely discussed, why from the government perspective, it seems to be not much and um, personally, I am also more agreeing with uh, my South Korean friends. So I would like to hear your opinions about it, and um, especially from the government side, what do they what do they think? Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. Lynn, you're Vietnamese. Uh, yes. Are you Are you calling from Vietnam? Uh, yes. I'm oh, from great. Vietnam. Good morning in Vietnam now. <laughs> Yeah. Well, okay. Well, look, congratulations on having the uh, the President of the United States visit you. I think that was a significant visit uh, last week. Um, if you have comments to contribute on that, because you're closer to, to what that was like and what the potential impact was and what the missed opportunities might have been. Um, but um, I leave that to you. But with regard to Japan as a middle power, I think economically, Japan is probably the third largest economy in the world now. And we always talk about GDP, we always talk about the wages, we talk about the price of the yen versus the dollar. And all of these um, components are undergoing great change, particularly as a result of you know, the change in GDP. That means the productivity per individual who is engaged in the economy. And with the declining birth rate, which is a, a hot issue for the prime minister, it's a hot issue for Japan, um, it has impact throughout the entire economy. <clears throat> And so as a consequence of that, yes, Japan is going to fall from the number three position to the probably the number five position within the next two or three years. Um, there's, there's no way around that. They can't have enough children. They can't import or you know, immigrate enough people into the economy to change that. They can over the long term through a, a bunch of different tactics. But yes, Japan needs to be comfortable with not being a super leader, not being the third largest economy in the world. But it does, um, you know, like you said, with some of the Southeast countries, Southeast Asian countries, Japan having this more prominent role economically is okay because of, you know, the shipment of, of, of products and manufacturing capabilities and intellectual property throughout Asia. It has worked to kind of hollow out Japan, but it has enriched uh, many of the countries, Vietnam being one of the great beneficiaries there uh, because of their their enormous uh, population of young people, and the fact that they're just uh, on a huge uh, economic development uh, 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 initiative. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, President Joe Biden was there. He skipped going to other countries. He went to Vietnam. That's very significant. He went, 
he didn't even go to Indonesia. He went to India and then from there to Vietnam. So rather than going to Indonesia for the ASEAN, he skipped that, went to India and then to Vietnam. I think that's significant too. The fact that Japan is a uh, major economic superpower is not uh, the same thing as saying Japan is a major defense or military superpower, even though when you line up Japan's defense capabilities or the amount of money that is devoted to it in terms of GDP, um, a um, military superpower, it is probably, um, even though it's, a, it's not called an army, the self-defense forces, if everything was taken into consideration, it would probably be the fifth largest uh, military force in the world. That is a unsettling and it is um, uh, worrisome for certain countries, some Southeast Asia countries, but also for Russia and for China. They don't want to see uh, Japan going from 1% of GDP to 2% of GDP. This really um, makes them um, worried. And I think Japan could pull it off. Um, they need to change their, uh, their constitution in order to achieve that. But I think there are a lot of changes that are going on here. Japan and the prime minister said himself, he wants Japan to be, you know, the, the rule maker. He wants to be the, uh, the negotiator between these countries and play a, a defining um, diplomatic role in those areas that it can. And it's not, to it's not typically military yet, but it seems like it's quickly going in that direction. In fact, you might have missed this, but um, the... Um, let me see. His title is, I think he's, Vladimir Putin is the president. This is maybe the prime minister of, of Russia, Dmitry Medelev, uh, said um, just this last week. I mean, they have defined September 3rd as a national day um, just this last year. And that national day, the title of that da national day is the day of victory over militaristic Japan. This is a new thing. Um, and once again, heightening uh, Japan's role in the South Pacific. We've talked about, you know, the um, the military exercises, the naval exercises, the live firing drills, as the uh, Chinese and the Russian fleets have passed between Hokkaido and Honshu, and also uh, through the Sahalin uh, uh, island chain. So it is very worrisome. Um, if there should be a hot conflict in the South Pacific as a consequence of Taiwan, then that means it engages uh, Japan uh, distinctly because of Okinawa and the U.S. forces there, also the Philippines. But there's also on the northern uh, area, there's, um, there's still conflict there. The, um, the Russians still occupy the four islands that are uh, at the, the source of controversy between Russia and Japan. They ha still haven't signed a peace treaty as a consequence of that. So um, it could be that um, Japan, in its struggle to maintain its pole position, it wants it doesn't want to go into that middle ground. It wants to stay as one of the leaders. It means that they have to um, potentially join NATO. We've talked about that here, or a form of NATO, or maybe be the kingpin of forming a NATO-like alliance in the South Pacific. Um, and that is uh, a real potential too. The first thing, though, is changing the constitution, even in light of the fact that the Japan military industrial complex, even at its early stages of, of development, is trying to develop that industry and to build um, components for export that don't have right now uh, offensive capabilities, but exclusively defensive or maybe dual use capabilities. Um, and the LDP and the Komeito have been in struggling to define those terms, Komeito is pulling back and saying it needs to be de defensive in nature and dual use. We can we can talk about that, but by the way, we need a little bit of help on our election districts and they made peace there as a consequence of this horse trading that happened. So yeah, I think it's a great question. Japan inevitably will fall into that middle category and be a leader of the middle category. But I think uh, for some countries, um, particularly the United States, it would prefer to see Japan as the, the strong Asian country that they can defend this, you know, potential incursion of China and also uh, what's going on with Russia, um, just to keep tabs on uh, their um, expansion policies. But, you know, this, this worrying move of um, Kim Jong-un going to Vladivostok and going to the spaceport, 
that also is a um, really serious um, additional complication to this this calculus of this mix. And when you think about how you know global um, conflicts start, this has all the earmarks of building up into that uh, that kind of pinnacle. We hope it doesn't, but um, you know there's a, there's a lot going on here that uh, that deserves attention and just following and keeping those pieces you know um, kind of close at mind and and tied together. So I hope uh, our briefing uh, does some of this for you, um, but we're all, always interested in comments like uh, like yours, Lynn, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Um, well, Timothy, it, well, I would like to go back to the cabinet because this is, you know, uh, the big news now. And uh, we have seen, so um, we know that uh, the ministerial portfolio, I mean, the Ministry of uh, Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism remains in uh, the hands of Comaito. So, but we have only one ministerial post uh, given yeah. to Comaito this time. And we have also two independent um, ministers who are also, uh, well, one of them is, uh, of course, uh, she remains and the other one is a new uh, minister. But I just wondered, um, so there are no other parties actually uh, who have been given ministerial posts in this cabinet. So what uh, can we make from this? Um, that's great. I have a chart on it. I'm digging through my stuff now for my chart, which um, talks about the distribution of uh, minister positions depending mm -hmm. on the factions. Um, oh, yes. Okay. So maybe I can help you with that. Okay. Because, so yes. in the previous Kishida cabinet, the distribution was pretty much set. There were four that were devoted to the Abe faction. And I wish I had my chart because I don't want to get this wrong. Yes. Okay. So here I got it. I've got it. So the okay, Abe good. the Abe faction has um, now ninety nine members. We didn't really talk about that um, last week. The Abe faction had one hundred members. That's three digits one zero zero. Of some psychological significance, they lost a member this last week, and now they have ninety nine members. Um, they had four cabinet posts in the previous administration. They have four cabinet posts now. The next largest uh, faction is the Aso uh, faction, which has almost half of what the Abe faction has, but it has the same number of posts as the mm -hmm. Abe faction had last time and as the Abe faction has this time. So that, that causes, I think, if you're in the Abe faction and you say, look, we've got the largest number of uh, politicians in our grouping and we only get four posts, what the hell is with that? At the same time, they're kind of still struggling with their leadership. And as we talked about, this triangle between Motegi, Aso, and Kishida is missing a uh, central Abe faction figure. So that's probably one of the reasons why. But in any event, you've got Aso at 55 members. He has four uh, positions. Mr. Motegi is the third largest faction. He's got 54 members. He's the secretary general. He had three portfolios before. He has three portfolios now. The Kishida faction, which is the fourth largest, has 46 members. They had four positions last time. They have three positions this time. You can think about what's going on there with the prime minister saying, look, I've got, I am the prime minister. I can call all these shots, but I can give up one of these ministerial portfolios to garner the support and affection of somebody else, which is exactly what he did. And he gave that to the independents. But before I get there, the um, fifth largest is the Nikai faction with 41 members. They had two in, previously, they have two now. And the independents with 75 members. So these are people who belong, these are members of the Diet who belong to the LDP, but they don't have a faction affiliation. Uh, Mr. Hamada was the defense minister previously. He was an independent. There are some independents in the, the cabinet now too. They had two positions previously, they have three positions now. So the distribution to um, the factional politics is kind of maintaining status quo. But you can imagine that the Abe faction is not very pleased with that, with as much power that they have, but they're also kind of kicking themselves because they weren't able to come up with a significant single leader to be at the same table with Motegi, Abe, and Aso. 
And so I think you're going to see the Abe faction really starting to come to terms with that. Although it's, you know, it's, it's led by a committee of 15. Um, their chairman is just called the chairman of the committee, the leadership committee. He is the uh, appointed spokesman, but I think there are a lot of voices there. And as we've discussed on this, on this uh, briefing before, you know, the majority of members in the Abe faction are less than four term members uh, for the lower house. For the upper house, that would mean uh, less than three terms. So the lower, the upper house, they have a six year term. And so having survived that um, twice, that's 12 years, three, three terms is 18 years. By the time you've been in the upper house three terms, you're still you're starting to look for a minister portfolio. But all of the of all of the portfolios that have been distributed, very few go to the upper house, maybe three or two this time. Mr. Uh, Takemi is one of those upper house members, but there might only be three of them or two of them uh, among the 19. So it is um, it is somewhat difficult for the lower house. It's a lot more rumble tumble. Um, but uh, the distribution according to political factions, is something that's carefully watched and probably a bone of contention that, that you're going to see flare up uh, in the near term, probably before the end of the year. Well, right. And um, also, so we have 11 uh, new ministers, actually, who are ministers for the first time. And uh, I think it is only natural to expect uh, some, uh, let's say, some new policies to be implemented or let's say discussed and so on but at the same time i think that knowing how things stand you know in uh, organizations here in japan the newcomers uh, usually keep quiet as well so what do you think the dynamic uh, will be there because can we really expect anything new from uh, from the new appointees or is it just you know the same old thing and then uh, the cabinet uh, is probably going to be run uh, by those who have been there for a while right so um when the cabinet is is announced you've got all sorts of different pundits who say it's just the same old thing it's the guys have are wearing the same suits have just changed their their neckties um i understand some of that argument but for the prime minister he knows he has to have change this is a cabinet of change but it's change within the confines of what Japanese politics actually allows. So I kind of am leaning towards the uh, opinion that it's going to be much more of the same, but I think you're going to see a little bit more energy devoted to those issues like wages, um, the inflation, um, women and uh, birth rates and um, women's participation in, uh, in uh, government and in the economy. Even the, the Tokyo Stock Exchange has the you know maybe thirteen percent of of the the people at the stock exchange are are women and that's a, a among all of the industrial countries that's very low as we talked about the um, World Economic Forum uh, assessment of where Japan stands so six six members in the cabinet plus the LDP is pretty significant it's a big number um, so I think you're going to see more emphasis being put on that the prime minister really needs if he's going to have a snap election or if he's even going to survive as prime minister, he needs to have that women's vote. And so I think you're going to see um, a lot of action going on there. On defense, I think you're going to see more of the same. Probably the uh, current defense minister is going to be a little bit more um, adroit and pushing for moving uh, this one per from 1% to 2% and the uh, systems that are being purchased. I think you'll be seeing a lot of that. On diplomacy, I think you'll see pretty much uh, the same thing. I think uh, uh, Minister Kamikawa is um, well versed three times as foreign minister, as a fine um, justice minister. I mean, that's a that's a big deal. Um, I think she will be a, a a great supporter of the prime minister, and I believe she comes from his faction as well. So there's something to be said for that. Yeah, she does come from his faction actually. Um, so yeah. The economy, wages, I think you'll see some, some movement there. But yeah, try and keep it steady. Um, there are, you know, 39% are approving his new cabinet position. Whereas before the cabinet, he was probably in the 32s. I think last week when we reported on uh, these, these surveys come up every month or so. So it's not a, a weekly report. But just because they uh, announced the new cabinet, they did do a, a, a poll on 
how people feel. And now it's 39.8%. Who knows how long that's going to last, but it was coming off of something like 32%. Uh, GG Press always is a little bit more harsh with the prime minister, and that put him in the high 20s. So it remains to be seen. The prime minister is out of the country. He's going to be coming back into the country. Uh, there's still no schedule for having an extraordinary diet session. I anticipate that there will be one. They'll talk about an, a supplemental budget, so there'll be more money pumped into the economy. When they do this supplemental bu budget, it is kind of emergency money that's being pushed into the economy rather quickly. So I think you're going to be seeing something like that, and people will be clapping their hands, especially those who are on the receiving end of that. And then after the supplemental budget, maybe um, from what I'm hearing, uh, there might be an election that's held before the end of the year. I just don't see that happening logistically. But if there is going to be a, um, a snap election for the lower house, um, I, my crystal ball doesn't go that far. I, lots can happen. And like I said earlier, um, it's really difficult on a positive end to move the economy, to move the, the approval rating of the prime minister and the cabinet forward very aggressively. But on the negative side, you can. It can scandal and, um, you know, some sort of a, a, a mischoice of, of words or somebody drinking inappropriately. That can cause uh, a tumble and, you know, with uh, a no confidence motion, that can happen within the span of, of two or three weeks. So it remains to be seen. There could be some other um, activity going on in North Korea, um, in uh, Taiwan, in the South Pacific. Uh, with rocket debris falling down. I mean, all you need is um, a Japanese citizen somehow uh, being killed as a consequence of this, and the whole dynamic changes. So uh, a lot can happen, and uh, a lot is pretty much uh, just week by week being um, being discussed. So um, hard to say. Great question, though. No, thank you for the, uh, the explanation. Gabor has um, a very, very nice comment there. Um, for that. So great summary team, always refreshing to listen to your insightful briefing. So thank Thanks you, Gabor. Gabor. Yes. And uh, Miran uh, Tajafar, so uh, talking about um, going back to Lynn's question. So uh, Miran says, I would say Japan is a great power. And uh, yes, we also have a couple of uh, greetings this morning. And uh, well, uh, Gerard also uh, shared the link about uh, the Unification Church and how um, state uh, heads of state in other countries, they have also talked at uh, meetings of uh, the Unification Church in other countries, not here in Japan. So it's not only a Japanese problem, it's not only um, a challenge here, uh, it's um, obviously a global issue. And can, well, I, can I interrupt you there? Sure. So, Go ahead. so a lot of people are not quite familiar with the Unification Church. It's kind of like, um, uh, well, it, it it is the church that kind of brought people together. They had mass marriages. It started in South Korea. Um, so it's not just Japan. In fact, there were lots of issues that were being developed by the Unification Church to build a tunnel, actually, from uh, southern Japan into South Korea. Uh, Funds have been spent, construction has started, that's been stalled. But it's, as you said, Maya, it's not just a, a, a Japan issue. A lot of people think it's, it's maybe a Buddhist sect that was started in Japan, but it's no, it's a global uh, initiative. And that's why they had so much money and they had so much concentration about trying to, to develop their base in Japan and also to launch a, a political arm of the church as uh, did um, Sokagakkai with their successful launching of uh, Kometo. So they saw that as a pattern and something to emulate. So I think, yes, with the knives out on the Unification Church, the fact that Mr. Abe was assassinated as a consequence of that, I think the die is pretty much cast that the Unification Church will, number one, be fined. Uh, the fine is not that significant, uh, 100,000 um, yen uh, as, a, as a consequence of you know, not being forthcoming with your responses that are being um, issued on a regular basis from the education ministry, and then to move from there to a disbanding. But it's going to be a long process. They want to draw it out. The Abe faction and the prime minister wants to draw it out because there are so many people that are implicated somehow. And I think if there's going to be a, a shaking up of the cabinet, I think it's going to be um, due to the unification issue. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, well, Gabor also continued, uh, well, his next comment is that uh, bringing uh, an end to the Unification Church scandal by disbanding that uh, cult could be one deliverable Kishida can put on the table showing he's actually done real gover governing and policy result. Um, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen for, for the next year. So no. it is in the district court. They will have a fight in the district court. They will go to the um, the the regional court, and then uh, they will have that fight there, whether they win or lose, and then it'll go to the Supreme Court. That whole process, it's going to be drug mm -hmm. out on purpose so that the people who might be implicated or might be suggested to be guilty, that time span just is, is stretched out. And so um, they... They escape the scrutiny um, over a, uh, you know, it, it, the news is just petered out over a longer period of time. But I think, yes, I, I agree with Gabor. Eventually it will come out. I don't know if it'll come out and they will be disbanded in the Kishida administration. Uh, but let's see. Yeah. Let's see. And um, considering how much money is involved, I really ha don't have very high hopes of. Uh, the Unification Church being disbanded entirely here in Japan, but uh, who knows really? So there may be some kind of uh, you know resolution at the end of the day. Great. So um, with this, we have uh, finished you know the comments and questions. So Timothy, you can go around about your day. So we are in the middle. It's a three-day weekend, Maya. A, a three-day weekend. So uh, well. You know, the day is yours. And uh, thank, thank you. you very much to everybody who uh, joined us uh, in Clubhouse, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, it looks like uh, some of the platforms um, still, you know, they present challenges and so on. But hopefully, uh, those challenges will be resolved in the future as well. <laughs> who knows, really? And, uh, well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I wish you... Uh, mm, that's a good... Um, and respect pleasant. for Elders Day. Respect for Elders Day. And yes, <laughs> to everybody, Timothy, I know that you would appreciate some fruits, maybe fl flowers. <laughs> Not really. Okay, thanks for mentioning that. And uh, we'll be here once again on Wednesday uh, at 8 o'clock uh, in the morning uh, where, when we'll be talking um, about a new book that has been issued here for uh, being successful as a business uh, person in Japan. Uh, Henry Seals is going to be our guest then. Uh, right. Also next week, yes, we're going to be uh, on Sunday again at 8.20 with Timothy Langley. And uh, in the meantime, we wish you a successful week as well. That's all. So, Timothy, please um, get your best smile so that we can end the, the live stream. Yes, indeed. <laughs>